Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm Sandy Alnock and I'm making messes. You might have had this kind of thing happen and you felt like, gee whiz, I have totally ruined my painting. What have I done? I decided to just move on with it. You can see my hesitation. My brush just paused a moment and I wanted to see where this bleeding was gonna go. Like how far was it going to extend? And I decided to just keep going. I wasn't too worried about it because I was gonna do pen and ink with it. And I also then did some things in watercolor to recover from that mess. If you want more on the watercolor portion, that's on my Patreon for my $10 and up folks. They get real-time watercolors every month. So you can join up and see that. But this video today is gonna to be doing the pen and ink portion after this watercolor wash. All right, so let's get started with pen and ink. There are plenty of artists who do their wash and ink pieces in a completely opposite way than I do. And I am in awe of them because for me, when I start something, I generally don't feel as confident when I'm doing my pen and ink on just a big, giant, white piece of paper because everything relies on those lines being perfect and being perfect the first time because you don't get to erase them. Now there's things you can do to get around that, of course, but my pen and ink work tends to be on the sketchy side, as you can see here. I don't tend to make really nice, crisp, clean lines and just, it's just not my style. So I do my watercolor wash first in, in most cases. And I wanted to talk specifically about the pen and ink portion here because there's a lot of people doing Inktober and I thought it might be helpful to talk about how I use pen and ink with watercolor. What I'm doing here is giving control to some things, like the outline of it. I was looking at several crow photos, trying to figure out how this bird was going to be facing the moon and yet turning its head toward the scarecrow, like laughing at him. That, that was kind of my vision for it. And so there's some of these parts right here where I am creating an actual shape because I wanted the division down the back of the bird to have a little control over it so that I can see where the wing is. But in between that, I tend to just make lines. And sometimes that works out great and looks exactly like the bird portion. But then sometimes I need to give it a little guidance. So my guidance tends to be with the outlines of the big shapes. And then when it comes to the inside here, when I get to these portions of the back of the wings, like it's all in black. It, there's not a whole lot of detail to be had. So I divide it into sections and I'm using the watercolor to follow those sections. Just visually, I'm tracing around it in, you know, in some ways, not every single time. I'm not trying to be religious about it, but what that does is give me shapes that are not going to be ones I make with my hand. And what I mean by that is when I start, and probably you as well, when anybody starts making lines of some kind, you're trying to draw shapes, often your hand will just repeat the same shape. You'll just, you know, you'll have a shape in mind and you'll make a whole bunch of them going down the backside of the bird. Like every single one of these shapes could have been long and skinny and that would have been that. But instead, what I've got is a whole bunch of different shapes. And you'll see this play out more in some of the other sections of this drawing slash painting, because in some areas, I want it a little more control. I want all these lines going the same direction in the tail. So it feels like a tail. But everything else in the rest of the feathers, the feathers go every which way and the light will hit them in weird ways and stuff. So I'm not really worried about that. You know, things like the toes. I didn't paint all that in, in the watercolor. Why would I bother to do that? That seemed kind of silly. So uh, the toes, I'm just going to draw in by themselves. When it comes to an area where the watercolor didn't give me a clean line, I can fix that as I go around it. But as much as possible, I'm going to try to stick with what the watercolor did and just let a few areas be ones that I'm, I'm repairing. Because you can get really obsessed with repairing every line so everything comes out perfect, and then you end up 
with a drawing that feels very mechanical. It doesn't feel like it's got some flow to it. So here's another section. This is just going to be darks. So I'm tracing around the shapes. And it's kind of like, have you ever seen those gerrymandered maps where politicians draw like all of the voters of one type into one section, all the voters of another type into another section. They come up with these like crazy wacky shapes for our electoral districts. Well, that's kind of where I think of this. There are shapes that my hand wouldn't make. If I were creating shapes inside the dark area of this hat, that's the last thing I would do. But look how much more beautiful it is than me just deciding I'm going to put all vertical lines in there. You can do that. And I do that plenty of times. But in order to make something that has more flow to it, that feels a little looser, then you can follow along with the watercolor. When I was painting this, I kind of just threw some brush strokes in here to give myself something to trace around. I deliberately didn't make it perfect so I could draw around some of the lighter shapes and turn them into the hay coming down in front of the face. And that's something that you need to think about when you're doing the ori original watercolor. Not that you have to plan out everything because you can fix it. I just fixed the nose shape to make it look more like a carrot. There's light down below it and I could have traced all the way around that, but then my nose would have ended up a weird shape. The mouth though could be a totally wonky shape. So I use the watercolor painting of that shape to trace with the pen. So sometimes I make it, <clears throat> excuse me, so that I'm following the watercolor for my guidance and other times it's literally just, just figuring out that that's a portion that's important to get like spot on perfect and then go from there. Now I switched to a lighter pen here. I was debating what this should look like. You could make this into a, like a pumpkin head for the face if you want, make triangle eyes, that kind of thing. And I was thinking of it as maybe a fabric something or other, or wrapping. I was, I was thinking almost like uh, uh, wrapping from a mummy, but vertical this time. So I just wanted some kind of texture in here and using the thinner pen really helped. And then I went to start, start to create those same kind of hay lines coming out of it. So, you know, all the stuffing that's inside the scarecrow. And you can see that some of them I'm looking for a shape in the watercolor. I'm looking for a highlight place. I'm looking for something that looks like the remnants of a brush stroke to create these loose feeling shapes. But I'm not trying to like deliberately make squiggles. Like that's not my goal is, you know, for some people, they want a really squiggly look. I want a flow to my pen and ink. I want the lines to feel like they belong together. They belong in the same drawing, but that they, they aren't just squiggly for the sake of being squiggly. They're squiggly and they follow something. They're, I don't know, they're, it's just something that's almost a half in control, half not in control type of pen and ink over watercolor. Maybe that's that's probably a more appropriate way to explain it. There are a million different ways though that you can handle pen and ink over watercolor. And I'm going to show you a bunch of other ideas here as well. But this is just something that has come up as there have been a bunch of people who've been taking my wash and ink class. So I have uh, several uh, different types of wash and ink classes and there's just been some questions about how I get that flow and how I get my lines following the watercolor sometimes and not others. Because a lot of people will just do all that watercolor and then they get like mind blown because it was supposed to be flowers and all they could think of to do was, okay, now I'm going to just draw flowers on top of it and call it done. And that's not really what I do necessarily. I look for particular shapes that I can use from the watercolor and definitely use them, and then others I ignore. So here I decided just to do some, I don't know if you want to call this, just line work, um, hatching in different directions, just a, a pattern, um, vertically, horizontally, angle to the left, angle to the right, and they're closer together with fewer spaces in between them on the shadow side, 
And then I'm just gonna let them slowly lighten up as I get to the highlight side. And you don't have to put pen and ink in every square inch either. And I, that's what I kind of decided to do. There were some interesting bleeds where these colors came together and I thought I'd use them in this hat band instead of doing it in the, you know, originally I was thinking of maybe making that a hay band running around the hat. And I thought, nah, I'm just going to do some lines in it. So part of it I did in vertical lines and part of it horizontal, but you can see I had used those shapes that were in the watercolor. And it just makes it look like it's kind of a mushy, distressed hat. He's been out in the rain. That's just kind of how scarecrows are. So I'm going to do the same thing on the top of the hat. I left some bounce light on one side because the watercolor left some bounce light. And I thought it would be cool to do that with the pen and ink as well. So I'm looking to the watercolor for some guidance in what I want to do in the actual drawing portion with the pen and ink. So here's another example of using the pen and ink to try to create the feeling of hay coming out of the, the sleeve. And in the actual watercolor video over on Patreon, I just had a little debate with myself over whether this was going to be like a mitten stuck into the sleeve of the scarecrow or whether this is going to be uh, just all hay. I didn't really know what I was going to do, so I just kind of left it mushy. And sorry, it's going off camera down there. It's just how my pen and ink goes. I get out of control and stop paying attention to where the camera's focused. Anyway, now I'm going to get into doing some more tracing of the watercolor shapes. This shirt is just a big area to cover. And it could get really boring really quickly. And, you know, depending on how much you want to try to make it look like fabric, that kind of thing. There's a lot of different ways you can handle it. I'm doing the same thing that I did in the underside of the hat. I'm looking for shapes in the watercolor and then I'm just going to use different directional lines to start filling them in. And I'm that kind of has a reflection of what I did on the hat because it's just lines going different directions. On the bird, there's lines going different directions. Sometimes I'll put a flow to them I'll make them a curved line that's kind of going around a shape of some kind. But I'm not trying to fill in every square inch in the shirt either. Because I want it to feel like there's some light creeping over on top of the shirt. I didn't want it to just be completely solid and filled in with ink. But you can just kind of see. I'm just going around each of the shapes and kind of making things that feel like those gerrymandered maps or just a topo map of some kind so that I have some smaller sections to do some more interesting line work. Uh, just It's interesting for me because my brain doesn't have to just, okay, now I have this massive three inch by five inch section that just needs lines and I'm just going to sit there and make the same line over and over again. This, this gives me more room to play and to move my pen in different ways and explore how that renders fabric. Does this even look like it's going to be fabric by the time it's done? It almost came out feeling a bit like patchwork, which would be appropriate for a shirt that you would put on your scarecrow out in your field anyway, which is good. Um, and I'll tell you a little story here that I also mentioned in the watercolor. And there are people who have tried to figure out, like, when did scarecrows first start? When were they first made? And there's all kinds of ancient history where they used to make all different kinds of figures, like some that were really frightening, weird, creepy figures that they would put out in fields to try to scare away birds and animals from their crops. But there was a time, apparently, in the Middle Ages when children were the ones that would go out in the field and just clap their hands. They'd run around and dance and clap their hands and wave their arms, chase the birds away. And apparently they started making scarecrows sometime after the bubonic plague when a lot of people died. They apparently didn't have children to send into the field to clap their hands. I can't even imagine like making that your children's job that they have to go out in the field and clap their hands. But, you know, having pets, I guess I understand that it makes sense because my pets hear me more if I'm making louder noises. Maybe I need a 
a child around to go clap their hands and get their attention when they're not listening to me. Because my, my kids, my dogs, go out in the backyard and need my attention because they're out there chasing squirrels or they see birds on the fence, etc. Maybe they are my scarecrow. Maybe that, that's what their job is, is they're actually scaring the crows away. But I don't have any crops out there, so I guess none of it makes sense. But this, this is the kind of stuff that runs through my head when I'm doing drawings. I, you know, was working on this for quite a while to put all this pen and ink in here and thinking about the scarecrows and the little kids out there clapping their hands. Craziness. Um, the prompt for today in Inktober, by the way, is remote. And I'm just going to call this okay for remote simply because if you're a scarecrow and you're out at night, you're going to be out in the middle of a field by yourself. You're going to be remote. So I am just going to give myself permission to call this good for the prompt. Now I did stop and do some more watercolor and I ended up just doing a wash over the whole cornfield, adding darker color in there because it just felt like it needed it. And then I added some line work in for the cornfield. Again, I'm following the watercolor, but here I had a bunch of the watercolor that didn't go on smoothly and I wanted something very vertical for this portion. Just made a separate decision for the background so that I could start making something that felt like there were plants. There was just something else going on there rather than just a mush mess. And I, I could have just left the mushy watercolor. I considered that but I just felt like it needed a little more tie in to the rest of the drawing, but only in the bottom section was I gonna put in a lot of ink work. And I'm gonna be leaving in that more open areas that don't have ink in them, whereas things like the dark shirt on the right hand side, I filled that in completely with ink lines. So you can strategically make decisions based on what you want to draw attention to. I left a lot of that bright green showing around the bird because I wanted to draw attention to the bird. I've talked about your focal point in your piece of art a lot of times. It's just where the darkest darks meet the lightest lights, which is already what the bird's got going on, but the extra bright color on that sleeve is what's gonna also pull your eye in. And I wanted to make sure that I just kind of drew the attention to the right place in my drawing. When it came to doing the top of the corn, I didn't do the entire corn because, you know, that would be a little bit overdone, I thought. So I just went part way up some of the stalks and I'm doing just vertical lines for them. Again, to try to do something a little bit different than the rest of the drawing, but it still has those groupings of vertical lines so that I have a bit of the feel of the, the kind of line work I've done elsewhere in the drawing. So trying to relate it, make it a little bit different since it's a different subject, but it starts to pull the whole thing together and then allows that glow to come up from the bottom. So my piece is all done and you can see there are places that are imperfect and that's okay. Just learn to embrace that imperfection because nobody's looking at your work as close as I'm letting you look at this. Everybody's gonna be stepping back from your work and, and assessing it. And they're going to see something different than you do. Like, I don't even see those bleeds hardly anymore. They just, they're gone because of everything else that's going on in the art. So tonight I'm going to be working on another piece during open studio, another wash and ink piece. I'll also show my holiday cards that I've got done so far. You can come and bring whatever it is you want to work on. If you've got questions about wash and ink, I'll be happy to answer those, but you can just work on your own Christmas cards, your own project, your painting, drawing, whatever, and just join us. We just have a fun time. It's not a recorded session. It's just us hanging out. So you can click on the link in the doobly-doo for Art Venture and find the event tab, and you can then see exactly what time it is in your zone, if you can't do the math from my zone. So I hope to see you there this evening. It's going to be a blast. And I'll talk to you very soon. Got another video coming up for next week. Take care and have a great weekend. Bye-bye.